pleasure to be here. So um, my talk will uh, recap a bit of uh, the concept that um, Masa has presented in this first inter uh, introduction about uh, chromatin. Um, so it, my talk has two parts. The first half is very didactic, just the, the principles of epigenetics and their interface with these nutritional uh, components that influence epigenetic marks. And the second half is some of the recent work from our laboratory that links this uh, to um, genome stability. So to understand epigenetics, you still ha you have to start with genetics, because epi just means on top of genetics. And of course, it, it doesn't replace the fact that our chromosomes carry a species-specific blueprint that guides the formation of the organism. This is true. It doesn't replace that. Every organism's genome is its blueprint. So you have about 3 times 10 to the ninth base pairs, 46 chromosomes, between 25 and 30,000 genes uh, that encode, uh, encoded in that DNA. Between the different people, look at your neighbor, there are about 2 to 3 million differences in base pairs between any two of you. Um, but few of those um, er changes correlate with phenotypes. They don't mean much, probably, most of them. Only five mutations are stabilized per species per year. That's calculated back to our, our uh, last common ancestor. And the remarkable thing is that very little of your DNA actually encodes for proteins, about 1.5%. And about 60 to 65% of your genome is junk. It is repetitive DNA, viral remnants of invaders that um, are not even, in, in any sense we know, um, really important for, for your survival, but they're there. So, However, what is important that even out of those 1.5% those, uh, of your genome that's encoding these 25 to 30,000 genes, it's really the restricted expression of the genes that define cell types of a, of a complex organism, the tissues and organs. And the phenotypes of aging and disease often reflect a loss of integrity of the restricted gene expression that defines the different tissues. So restricting genome expression is actually the realm of epigenetics, because your genome has a certain potential, a certain number of genes that could be expressed. And uh, epigenetics uh, tells the organism which ones to express in which cell type at which time, and lends a type of cell type memory. That means that a, a blood cell will beget a blood cell, muscle cell will beget blood, muscle cells, and so forth. In rare cases, epigenetics also mediates transgenerational inheritance of altered gene expression, often in response to stress, can be metabolic stress. What has been best studied in animals, at least, is usually starvation or extreme cases of nutrition. In plants, transgenerational uh, uh, inheritance is very common. The integration, how epigenetics also integrates environmental impact on gene expression, as, as Masa has just explained. And it differentiates the self, the genes that are yours versus the non-self, all the invading viral elements that um, have occupied our genomes for years. So. Um, in, in other words, um, epigenetics allows us to adapt to nutritional or environmental insult and to stabilize our genomes, the integrity of our genome against um, invasion, but also uh, mutation that occurs during aging and cancer. So I'm going to give you a real quick overview of what I mean by cell memory, because it's very important. How does it work? Well, basically, there are out of a, a, a totipotent fertilized oocyte, uh, you drive uh, stem cells of different nature that are going to be pluripotent or multipotent uh, progenitor cells. They differentiated to committed stem cells of different tissue types, 
And this is largely driven by transcription factors. And transcription factors, again, drive the differentiation into the terminal state, where very often about 90% of the genome is repressed. Epigenetics is involved in maintenance of the pluripotent and, and committed stem cell state. It's the memory which set of genes should be activated when the signal comes for terminal differentiation. Those signals come in many kinds. Many of them are developmental signals. If you think of just development, they can be uh, wind, notch, uh, retinoic acid, all kinds of developmental natural signals internal to the body. They can be hormones, uh, cause differentiation, wound growth, healing. They can be other kinds of stresses, uh, metabolic signals, nutrients, diet, starvation, stress like heat, damage, and so forth. All this can provoke a, ch a, a, a change, a terminal differentiation, or, or, or somehow, sometimes even de-differentiation. And uh, these are integrated through the epigenome. So as cells differentiate and your developmental potential of cells gets limited, more and more limited to the terminally differentiated cells which make up the functional body, the epigenetic restriction increases and fewer and fewer genes are expressed. This is called differentiation. And as we know, thank to Yamanaka and John Gurdon, much of this is reversible. And basically what you're reversing is the epigenetic programming, the epigenetic restriction on gene expression in terminally differentiated cells back to a pluri or plastic state where it can be reprogrammed into new cells. And this is, of course, very important for corrective genetics or restoring stem cell pools. Why does it work? It works because there's a fundamental different property for the way prokaryotic gene expression is controlled and eukaryotic gene expression. Prokaryotic gene expression is basically just a question of concentration of transcription factors they bind, the bind their cognate site, and they activate transcription. That makes RNA, that makes protein, and this is the basic dogma. Eukaryotic cells are very different. Transcription factor accessibility is the limiting factor for gene expression, not the abundance of transcription factors. And this modification of nucleosomes, as Masa has shown you, is key to gene expression and restriction of gene expression. So chromatin is the eukaryotic template for transcription and integrates signals through metabolism, through stress, through uh, natural uh, growth signals that will integrate into regulate promoters and gene expression. So we've already heard about histone acetylation. This is the active open chromatin that will allow promoters and enhancers to function. Then there are two types of repressive chromatin. There's the developmentally regulated genes that are suppressed or held in a, a poised state, a non-expressed but poised state by a certain modification on histone H3, lysine 27, trimethyl. I'll explain this in a minute. This is a facultative repression, that means that it depends on the cell type and the stage of development, whether the, the DNA or genes will be tagged by this mark. And then there's something called constitutive heterochromatin that remains compacted and repressed throughout development, um, and it has a characteristic mark, which is a different lysine on the tail of histone H3 that also becomes trimethylated. So these covalent modifications carried by histone tails are the signal to the packaging and silencing of the genome that's going to restrict the pattern of gene expression that's going to tell you what kind of cell you have. And again, as Masa mentioned, there are enzymes that mediate the demethylation and acetylation when you activate genes, and again, that deacetylate and methylate when it's time to repress. These enzymes are key to development and to uh, stress response. So a big breakthrough in the field of epigenetics was when the enzymes 
that deposit these specific modifications on histone tails. This, these different colors are the core, uh, hydrophobic cores of the histones. And this, these tails are very lysine rich. They're usually N-terminal, some C-terminal modifications as well. And every lysine and also arginine can be modified either by acetylation, phosphorylation, methylation, also ubiquitination. And these modifications come in very specific patterns and very, have very specific meanings. Now, what happened in the 90s, basically, was that we discovered that the enzymes that deposit these marks such as K27 that I mentioned, or K9 methylation I also mentioned. It was shown that these were um, already known genes that had been identified by studying fly developmental biology. So this told us that actually these histone marks are basic to development, to gene expression patterns, and, and launched the field of epigenetics on a molecular level rather than a phenomenological level. So we call these enzymes writers, such as the polycomb group, uh, the polycomb complex PRC2, which deposits the K9, uh, the K27, lysine 27 methylation. And readers, these are proteins that recognize the modification once it's put on the, on the histone tails. And then this complex actually itself has another enzymatic activity that deposits a ubiquitin residue, again, in this case, to silence the gene. But as I told you, his epigenetics is reversible. Not always, not rapidly, not easily, but definitely also physiologically, you can rewrite your epigenome, you can demethylate, deacetylate, and change the pattern of gene expression. So uh, these are um, key to understanding. Now, the enzymes are interesting, but even more interesting are the donors for these methylation and the cofactors for histone modification, which turn all out to be metabolic intermediates. S-adenosylmethionine is the universal donor for methylation. NAD is a cofactor for uh, deacetylation. Acetyl-CoA, of course, is the cofactor for acetylation. So these key intermediates are essential, metabolic intermediates are essential for histone modifications, while other intermediates actually inhibit the erasers, succinate, butyrate, NAM. These are inhibitors of the reversal of such marks. So that brings us immediately into the realm of food uh, or metabolism. And I'll get back, that, back to that in a minute. In addition to histone marks, there's DNA methylation. So there's a cytosines. Uh, whenever they're in a configuration of cytosine next to a guanine, uh, they can be methylated by a series of DNA methyl transferases that use SAM as the donor, as I mentioned, universal donor. And this uh, methyl group uh, sits in the um, major groove and uh, is a binding site for methyl readers. So what does DNA methylation do? It also represses, tends to repress um, certain promoters uh, when, in certain configurations. In other configurations, it marks active genes. But the important thing about methylation is that it has a built-in system of heritability because um, there is both a de novo enzyme for methylating uh, CPG residues um, in case of um, targeting, by, usually by transcription factors. But once you replicate and a new strand is synthesized, it doesn't have the methyl group. But there is a second DNA methyl transferase called DNMT1 that goes along with the replication fork and that um, deposits the uh, complementary uh, CPG, since it's, of course, CPG on each strand. And finally, there's also um, conversion. Demethylation is, can be an active uh, or a passive um, procedure. So um, this, again, is, of course, controlled by SAM.
I want to just recap very quickly because this, uh, this ability to um, transmit through cell division, uh, histone marks uh, or epigenetic uh, DNA marks is very important. And, and this summarizes basically what we know about DNA methylation in humans. Uh, human, the number of human, a uh, large fraction of human promoters have CPG islands. That means a large density of CPGs uh, that are found just upstream of transcriptional start sites. If these are generally um, non-methylated, they uh, repel DNA methyl transferases. But if they ever do get methylated, such as often in cancer and other cases, uh, developmentally regulated genes, um, then they are off. Whereas the rest of the genome has very few CPGs, but they're almost always methylated, 90% methylated. And the, those, when they're dispersed like this, if methylated, the genes are generally on. Only these CPG islands uh, are significant for gene repression. Now plants, and I know many of you may work on plants, they're very different. They have CPG methylation, but in their case, CPG methylation uh, covers gene bodies like, like here, but these are a signal for um, reverse, uh, an RNA dependent uh, uh, RNA polymerase, which will make double-stranded RNAs that then um, become incorporated and trigger um, the repression of the gene and the propagation of, of silencing. So whereas plants, um, a dispersed CPG pattern will trigger silencing, um, in, in mammals, a dispersed CPG pattern is not silencing, only the, the um, abundant CPGs at promoters. This plant um, propagation of methylation is a robust uh, mediates a robust transgenerational transgener inheritance, which is not the case in mammals. Many people talk about transgenerational inheritance in mammals. It's actually rather rare. Um, and this is the reason why. I'm only giving you this as a lesson uh, so you don't get you know, caught into the belief that CPG is, and, and the response to stress is very easily inherited. In mammals, uh, the fertilized zygote comes, the DNA comes from the papa and the mama, so the sperm and the oocyte. They uh, fuse to form a zygote, a two-celled uh, zygote, and then a blastocyst. And during those e early stages of, of um, after fertilization, there is a massive and active demethylation of the genome. So uh, there are two stages of demethylation, actually. Uh, one is during zygote, uh, uh, during uh, germ cell uh, formation. There's a demethylation, a remethylation, which will be specific for male and, spe and female um, germ cells. But then after fertilization, there is an active uh, demethylation. And only very few imprinted genes uh, remain methylated and carrying that DNA methylation mark. So it's important to remember that uh, there are very few, maybe a hundred, imprinted loci in mammals, and most of the genome that could carry the methylation mark due to stress or due to uh, parental deposition will be lost and then regained um, in a stochastic manner so that if, if it is a maternal or paternal imprinting uh, or, or repression, it will be stochastic regain of, of, of which allele will be repressed. Whereas the few that are imprinted, you can have parent of origin specific phenomena. Okay, so let's go back to nutrition. Um, I, I told you that that's all the basics about uh, epigenetics I'm going to give you, except to tell you that methylation requires metabolites such as s methionine. Uh, SAM levels are uh, directly regulated by folate and by vitamins, and I'll show you this. And is th this is the donor then for methylation of both DNA and um, lysines. And the deacetylate, de demethylation and deacetylation reactions need cofactors that are also um, uh, metabol metabolic, uh, metabolic intermediates. 
So epigenetic donors are regulated by diet and oxidative state. In simple terms, chromatin modifications are influenced by an organism's metabolic state. Now, just to give you a few more examples of this, here I told you SAM, the universal donor. You see that it is um, either it is uh, it, it, in its biosynthetic pathway. You need a number of amino acids that come from diet, but you also need vitamins that uh, catalyze um, the reaction. So vitamin B12 is necessary for methionine, and methionine is necessary for uh, combination with adenosine to create SAM, which will then allow methylation. So all these um, ingredients are absolutely necessary to maintain the epigenetic state that is um, necessary for proper gene expression. And just to, bring, to go one step further, um, here we're looking at the shift from an unacetylated or unmethylated histone to an acetylated state, which would be an active state, or a methylated state, which more often is a um, repressed state. And what you see is that a number of the intermediates in the, bio, in the TCA cycle, but also in the, acet uh, the production of acetyl-CoA, is obviously necessary for acetylation. NAD, uh, again, a metabolic intermediate arising from glucose metabolism, is necessary for deacetylation. For um, methylation, um, fumarate and succinate indirectly are inhibitors of the demethylation uh, reaction, and just as butyrate inhibits the deacetylation reaction. And finally, there are other intermediates like fatty acids that are necessary for the acetylation, or, uh, or sorry, that stimulates deacetylation. So just as SAM and NAD drive the modifications, there are other intermediates of metabolism that regulate the enzymes that are driving this pathway. And just to give you one example, this is a famous example of how it can influence, or one of the few examples we know of. Um, as I mentioned, um, promoters can be influenced by methylation. This is, the, uh, this is a, an experiment done by um, Jertel years ago, where he um, wanted to understand how this agouti mouse uh, pattern arises. Agouti is the gene that causes the dark coat on the mice. Upstream of the promoter of the agouti gene is one of these repetitive elements that comes from a virus that normally should be methylated. When it's methylated, uh, highly methylated, then the agouti promoter uh, is expressed. When it's unmethylated, however, um, you'll have an, an aberrant transcript starting from this um, uh, remnant of a viral invader, and that um, uh, means that agouti will not be properly expressed in the mice are very light colored. He wanted to know if diet would influence this. So just the take home here is that more methylation on the viral element uh, means that this promoter will not be used and the agouti will be used. So he did this experiment where he uh, gave pregnant mothers either a large amount of folate during uh, gestation or no added folate, and he asked what color the skin would be of the offspring of the fur. And indeed he found that, and this was really excessive amounts of folate, but in any case it led to a, a higher level of um, methylation, and methylation uh, of, uh, and, and this then inhibited this promoter such that more agouti mRNA would be made and the, there would be more of the dark-coated um, offspring. Whereas if there was a low level of methylation due to low folate, um, this promoter would be used and the agouti would not be expressed. So this is just a famous example of how diet influences um, expression. So epigenetics um, leads to um, a number of modifications of various aspects. Disease penetrance between identical twins has been one of the th subjects. Um, genetic preferences and uh, promoter usage, etc. But these 
I have to admit, are rather fine-tuning. They are not defining whether an organism exists or not. They're the fine-tuning of a genetic program. And what we mainly, the reason why we, we only see this fine-tuning is because what we've been studying in the, all these cases I told you is just like nudging the genes one way or another, a little bit more methylation, a little bit less, a little bit more acetyl, a little bit less. I wanted to ask the question, what happens if you wipe out all the methylation? Not of DNA, I'm using an organism that doesn't have DNA methylation. But what would happen if we just wipe out a whole mark and then ask, what happens to a complex organism if you no longer have methylation. Because basically, all we've been studying has been modulation. So, question that we wanted to ask is, what happens if all of this constitutive heterochromatin is completely lost? This constitutive heterochromatin covers about 60% or more of the genome. It covers all the repetitive elements, the simple repeats, the junk DNA that you want to keep quiet. So we, um, we couldn't do this in humans because, first of all, um, there are eight different enzymes that put on this H3K9 methyl mark, and no one has ever succeeded to knock out all eight. Um, this is just uh, to show you all the different kinds of transposable elements and tandem repeats that are repressed by this H3K9 methyl mark. Um, as you see, it, it make, makes up about 50 to, to 70 percent of the genome, and a large fraction of it are RNA transposons um, and a lot of pol 2 promoters that are not even driving human genes. So the organism we used is C. elegans. C. elegans is a complex organism. It has um, a, a fantastic, uh, the fertilized embryo differentiates into an adult organism that has muscle, gut, neurons, uh, all the major organs that are of importance except an immune system, um, and about 959 somatic cells define the adult organism outside of the germline. It also, um, has all the repeats and all the invaders that, Amer uh, that uh, a human or, or mam mammalian genomes have. They have DNA transposons, they have LTR retrotransposons and non-LTR retrotransposons. These are invaders that occupy the genome and then lots of simple repeats. They do not have centromere satellite because they're holocentric. And that characteristic also allowed us to study what would happen if you got rid of, of uh, heterochromatin because heterochromatin labels the centromeric satellite repeats. So we could do this because worms only have two enzymes that mediate this histone methyl, methyl mark. It's called MET2 and SET25. Um, we could eliminate the two enzymes by simply knocking out the genes. And when we did mass spec on the histones, there was absolutely no H3K9 methylation left in these organisms, not in embryos, nor in the larvae. The remarkable thing was that despite knocking out this abundant epigenetic mark, the um, worms still differentiated to adults. There was no chromosome loss. There was only slightly de de development, but 88% of the embryos reached adulthood. They were temperature sensitive sterile. That meant that the germline was not fertile at 25 degrees, but they were fertile at 15 or 20. And they were sensitive to replication stress and showed massive amounts of germline apoptosis. apoptosis. That led to this loss of fertility. This is actually brood size going from something like 200 um, to something like 10. <clears throat> and at 26 degrees, they were totally sterile. We asked if they were sensitive to other stresses. And, and actually, they were sensitive to replication stress. By If we interfere with replication, we found that these uh, worms died 
even uh, when they were somatic, uh, when they were uh, only exposed during somatic growth, they, they died. But they were not more sensitive than wild type to double strand breaks. So it wasn't all DNA damage, but they were very sensitive to replication stress. So we asked what happened if we look at the transcriptome. There were some genes that were misregulated, but the most striking misregulation, and this is a heat map of, of uh, upregulation over um, wild type levels, were that all types of repeats, these repetitive elements that are normally kept silent by this H3K9 methylation mark, now were massively expressed, sometimes uh, 16 to 32-fold above background. And they showed a temperature uh, dependence, much like the temperature-dependent uh, <coughs> sterility. So repeat elements of all types became expressed in these worms that no longer uh, could deposit H3K9 methylation. So what's the impact of repeat expression? So I'm just going to summarize. These worms accumulate large germline mutations, so some translocation, but small insertions and deletions, um, and, and many larger, even after only eight generations. And um, if we looked at copy number variation, the, we saw that there was a big variety in copy number of these repeats when they didn't have the proper methylation. So now the question was, why are these heterochrome to de deficient worms um, stress eight, uh, replication stress sensitive and conditionally sterile? Why can't they make uh, offspring? So we did a synthetic lethal screen for the geneticists out there. They'll appreciate that if you have a conditional lethal, that our, our worms were viable at 20 degrees, we could knock out the, every gene in the genome one by one and ask what genes are necessary for survival at 20, but would then no longer, that, that the worms would not survive um, if this other gene was taken away. So uh, we carried out this screen in the, in the double mutant background, and we had 69 hits. I'm going to show them to you. And all of them actually were synthetic sterile with one of the, the histone methyl transferases. <clears throat> that is called ESET in mammals. So when we characterized those hits, they were actually very, they grouped in very clear groups. One subgroup was regulating RNA degradation and processing, or even basal transcription factors, so the level of transcription. The others were chromatid remodelers, not too surprising. And the third group, the third major group, was Mute, uh, genes that regulate fork damage. And when we looked at this a little bit more closely, we saw that within this, well, there was TOPO2, that would interest some of you, some uh, nucleosome remodelers, uh, a subunit of cohesin, but then the BRCA1 complex. BRCA1 is a, is a human tumor suppressor gene that is necessary, actually. I mean, women who are even partially defective in that BRCA1 have a very high chance of developing breast cancer. And actually, BRCA1 is a, is a trimeric complex. All three subunits came out in the screen. It interacts with RAD51 and, and also with BRCA2, which actually is BCCIP is a BRCA2 binding protein and nolate is a BRCA2 regulator. So why was this interesting? These factors actually are all, have all in common the requirement that they are required for recovery from replication fork stress. So replication fork stress happens when you're replicating your DNA and the replication fork cannot continue <coughs> because it encounters either RNA-DNA hybrids, foldback structures, or DNA lesions. Now, this set of proteins that we pulled out one by one as synthetic lethal with loss of K9 methylation were actually mediating um, the degradation of this R RNA DNA hybrid. And this has been characterized by Andres Aguilera, 
<clears throat> the BRCA1 complex is involved in, in um, helping unwind and then per, uh, allow the degradation of RNA transcripts that are annealing during um, transcription. And the exosome, which we also pulled out in our screen, is involved in degrading as well the RNA um, that, is, uh, that, that can potentially cause RNA-DNA hybrids. So RNA-DNA hybrids arise when DNA unwinds and the nascent transcript actually anneals. RNA is much more stable than DNA and RNA hybrids. I'm almost finished. I just need to get to the punchline here. So it had also been shown that in mammals, BRCA1 brings in a helicase that degrades um, RNA-DNA hybrids. So we looked for RNA-DNA hybrids in our worms, and indeed, the, the, the methylation-deficient worms accumulate RNA-DNA hybrids. That's a hybrid between RNA-DNA within the DNA um, that's isolated. It was temperature sensitive. And when we knocked out any subunit of the BRCA1 complex, we found the same phenomenon. They were also sterile. We asked the question whether BRCA1 also derepresses the, the, the simple repeats that become re expressed um, in, in the histone defi uh, methylation deficient worms. It does to a small amount, but is highly synergistic when we combine it um, with, the, with the histone deficient worm, in the, with the histone methylation deficiency. So what we see is a strong synergy between repair factors that are specifically acting at replication forks and histone methylation. Indeed, it's been observed that BRCA1 tumor suppression may occur via heterochromatin-mediated uh, silencing, and that the, the, uh, the loss of BRCA1 uh, also correlates with um, a derepression of satellite RNA in mammalian cells. And expression of satellite repeats is often found in cancer. So this is my last slide uh, that summarizes what I think is the most important role of histone H3K9 methylation. That is to keep repetitive elements, which I told you occupy about 70% of your genome, completely silent so they're not expressed. Because when they are expressed, the RNA is not processed, the RNA is not spliced and exported, but it hangs around and forms RNA, stable RNA-DNA hybrids, which form when the replicate and blocks the replication fork when the, you try to replicate the DNA. And this turns out to be the source of most of the genome instability that we could detect in the worms that were deficient for histone methylation. So to sum up, what it good is epigenetics for? And why should we be concerned about our levels of methionine and SAM and, and histone metabolites, or epigenetic metabolites? One, for the patterning of gene expression. A second, for this um, ability to, uh, let's say, uh, remember stress and inherit a, a stress resistance. But third, and probably most important, for the differentiation of self from non-self, the identification of what DNA um, needs to be continuously silent and what DNA needs to be expressed to define the organism. So stabilization of genome integrity is the major role of H histone H3K9 methylation. And loss of this occurs not only in cancer, but also during aging, aging and organ dysfunction. So in the end, to tie this back to nutrition, as I mentioned, there are many sources, many ways in which uh, nutrition will feed into histone methylation. And I've given you just one example of how histone methylation can be absolutely essential for the viability of an organism. So I'd like to thank my lab, and I'm happy to take questions if there's still time. Thank you.